for a night of Bible study. If you're not familiar with the Christadelphians, we're a strongly Bible-based community. We're not here after your money. We're not going to ask for any collection at the end of the night. We're not here to show you any fantastic miracle of our own doing. What we're here to do is to show you what we have discovered within the pages of the Bible and to ask your attention to that book, the Bible. We want you to see whether the book, the Bible, provides the answers that we feel are in its pages. We feel that it provides us with good news and with hope for this difficult times that we live in. And particularly this topic tonight is one very close to the heart of every Christadelphian. Every Bible student reads the Bible seeking God's purpose with the earth and with mankind upon it. And we suggest that the Bible offers some very good answers on exactly that subject. The structure that we're going to follow through tonight is this. How do we know that God has in fact created the earth? There's plenty of people who tell us that it's not God's doing, it's simply an <coughs> act of random chance. And what is his purpose? If he did create it and create it well, then what was he intending for that planet to be like? What was his purpose with it? Is that purpose currently occurring? Can we see that being outworked? And what is God going to do about that? How is he going to fix that? How is he going to accomplish his purpose in the earth? And finally, how can you be involved? Just to give you some background to myself, I, I do have a degree in a medical area. So we're going to talk about some scientific things tonight. Uh, and if it's expected of me to lay down my cards on the table, I do have a, a university degree in a medical area. Um, so I hope that my words are not considered to be completely uneducated. But when we look at the earth itself, we find that it is well called by the scientific community the Goldilocks planet because it's too good to be true. When we look at this planet and find out that it's too good to be true, it becomes very clear, if you're prepared to consider it, that this planet was created. It just didn't happen by chance and therefore everything also on it. You know, if we were to look at a small pile of rocks, we would say that they occurred in that particular arrangement simply by chance. And it's fairly an obvious conclusion that you would draw if you were to see that. If we were to see those organised, and I've been to a place in New Zealand where it's tradition to have piles of stone along the road, and when you see those piles of stone carefully balanced, you assume that the hitchhikers through there have followed the tradition in that region of making little piles to commemorate their journey. And you'd see that and you'd say, OK, that's been organised by somebody. It doesn't happen by chance because wind and weather would knock that over. But if we were to see something like this, a definite shape in the stones, we would say that it has been sculpted. You know, ladies and gentlemen, when we look at Earth, we see far more than just a sculptured shape. What we see is an enormously vast array of life forms, all interdependent on each other. Where you can't have one without the other, they're all interdependent and reliant on each other, hinting that they all must have been put together at the same time, put in their place together. You know, the chances of that happening are unscientific. The chances of that happening by chance are completely unscientific, ladies and gentlemen. You know, that, that particular probability is very, very simple, very logical for anyone to understand. If I threw a handful of coins at a checkerboard, you would expect to see them randomly placed, not stacked carefully one upon another. That does not occur. And yet I've had discussions with people who are believers in evolution, and they claim that is what is happening in Earth. You know, we, we find that the actual area where life is actually found in the universe, as far as we can tell, is as thick as three coats of varnish on a bowling ball. That's how much of Earth, if we were to scale it down, is actually bearing life. As thick as three coats of varnish on a bowling ball. And the rest of the universe is almost completely lacking in life whatsoever. The complexities and the wonderfulness of life is not found throughout the rest of the universe, as far as we can tell. For as many miles as we can see in every direction, real life has not been found. 
perhaps little fragments that might look like it. Why is that? Well, because, ladies and gentlemen, we can, we can focus sin on the earth and look at all the things that have been created here and spend a whole night talking to you about how marvellous it is. But I want you to just step back tonight and just look at earth from a distance. You know, earth from a distance creates a very fascinating story of uniqueness. You know, we, we often get these science fiction sort of stories that crop up in, in fiction. You know, people have films made about Star Wars <coughs> and space travel. It's completely fictitious. This idea that people think may even be scientific of, of travelling to the stars is actually ridiculous to scientists because space is a horrible place. It really is awfully unlivable. Do you know what? Well, let's just have a little chat about space out there and we'll start to see just how amazing Earth itself is. Let's take a long distance view and talk very briefly about galaxies. Apparently there are three types of galaxies. There's the spiral galaxy, the elliptical galaxy and the irregular galaxy. Now, the, irregular, the spiral galaxies are the one that we exist on, the Milky Way. It's the safest and the Hubble teles uh, telescope shows that nearly all galaxies have a black hole at the centre which release deadly gamma rays, X-rays, particle radi radiation. So you don't want to be too close to the centre, even in a spiral galaxy, because the pressure of all the gases and particles there is compressed to the point where you have a black hole and lots of nasty radiation released, which would wipe out all life. So you've got to be a reasonable distance out on the spiral arm of one of those galaxies to be able to escape from the black hole in the centre. What about elliptical galaxies, egg-shaped galaxies, some call them? Well, the stars within those randomly move. They don't have the nice circular movement that you have in a spiral galaxy. And so solar systems or planets can move at any time into the centre of the galaxy and back out again, therefore passing through those dangerous black holes and those dangerous radiation areas in different parts of the galaxy. And finally, you've got the irregular galaxy, which is the most dangerous type, uh, where you can have supernovas, massive explosions of galaxies going off unpredictably in any part of the galaxy, giving off huge bursts of gamma radiation, which will wipe out all life on Earth extremely quickly. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, space is not a safe place. There really is only one type of galaxy that you can survive on. And not only that, You've got to be just at the right point on that galaxy for life even to be thought of being possible. To think of life in any other position is just ridiculous. What about the sun? Let's zoom in a little bit more. The sun actually has to be the right type of sun. It's got to, be, it's got to meet certain requirements. It's got to be the right mass. It must be a yellow dwarf, and we'll talk about why later. It's got to give off the right sort of light it's got to be the right age, because as a sun goes through its life cycle, it becomes more active or less active. We need just at the right point. We need to be the right distance from that sun. And we need to be in the right, that sun itself needs to be in the right orbit within its galaxy. If it's in the wrong place, you're going to finish up passing too close to a black hole, and all life will be wiped out. And of course, the sun has to exist in the right type of galaxy, where there's no nasty supernovas, or extreme radiation. Do you know the tolerance factors on our sun are very, very fine. If you were in a different, uh, near a different sun, or we were circling around a different sun, life just wouldn't exist. We're an average distance from the Earth of about uh, one, uh, 149 million kilometres. We're distant from the centre of the galaxy of 30,000 light years. There's a diameter in our sun from the, uh, across the equator is uh, 1.3 million odd kilometres, rotation period of 25 days, a mass is, uh, is 30,000 times the mass of Earth, gravitation is 27.9 times greater than Earth, and the temperature at the core is 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. If any of those things change, even subtly, there would be no life on Earth. It just wouldn't be providing Earth with the right sort of solar system to exist in. Um, our sun is within the 10% of the most massive suns within the galaxy. It's a yellow dwarf, but it's just right to produce more blue light than most stars. 
So we're in that, there's a 10% chance of getting the right size star. And within that 10%, you've got to give off just the right type of light. And that's determined by the mass and the energy given off by the sun. If you didn't have that right type of light, guess what? You wouldn't have photosynthesis, a process by which the plants survive, something that's absolutely essential for life here on Earth. So even the, the sun itself is perfectly matched for life here on Earth. Here's another interesting thing. The sun actually is quite dangerous. It gives off radiation, charged particles, in, uh, sometimes in solar flares, where billions of tons of superheated gas and charged particles are blasted out in different directions. And amazingly, our sun, while it's perfect in other ways, though it shoots out these, these uh, charged particles, Earth is actually protected from it. Unlike some planets, Earth has a magnetic field around it. And it shields it from the radiation coming from the sun. So there you go, our sun has good points and, shall I say, bad points, and yet the Earth is the right sort of planet. It's matched to be shielded or protected from the very effects that our sun throws out by this magnetic shielding effect. That's why you get the uh, aurora borealis, the, the southern and the northern lights, because the charged particles hitting Earth go round Earth. You've probably seen that experiment when you get a magnet and uh, put it on magnetic um, filings, iron filings, and they form a nice little ring around the magnet, all polarising and lining up. That's what happens to the charged particles. As they come flying in towards Earth, they hit this magnetic field and are drawn around to the two poles. And then the energy striking the atmosphere at the poles lights up the poles and gives an absolutely fabulous display. And thankfully doesn't kill everyone on Earth. So our sun is just perfectly matched with the planet that we exist on. Not only that, within our solar system, we live in something that's called the circum, uh, circumstellar habitable zone, which means we're just the right distance from this perfect sun that we have to survive. If we were just a little bit closer or a little bit further away, we'd be in big trouble. This is the zone where liquid water can be found. If you get too close to the Earth, the water would evaporate, we'd have runaway greenhouse effect get too far away, and the water and the carbon dioxide would freeze. A 5% change in distance in the, Earth, uh, in the Earth's distance to the sun would be the end of life as we know it on Earth. It's an incredibly fine-tuned balance, ladies and gentlemen. This doesn't just happen by chance. Mercury, that's just a little bit closer to the sun. Well, one side of it gets to 430 degrees C, and the other side to <coughs> minus 180 degrees C as it goes around the sun. Not so good for life. Let's go to the other extreme. You can go to Uranus, where the surface temperature is minus 210 degrees Celsius. And it's made of, well, there's all sorts of nasty gases which are held in. The size of the planet is also important. Very large planets, like Jupiter, have a much larger gravitational force. So all sorts of gases are retained within the atmosphere, including a lot of dangerous ones like hydrogen. Whereas in our atmosphere, it's just right to keep the right gases in our atmosphere and not floating away. I mean, we're talking the thickness of three coats of varnish on a bowling ball. It's not much. And yet the entire galaxy, solar system, sun, planets around us are perfectly matched, perfectly balanced, so that life is possible in that thin sliver of surface that we have on this planet we take so for granted. You know, there's a lot of astronauts who get their, their uh, comments quoted because they're famous and they don't disagree with science. But some of them who've been up there and seen it all are really stunned by it and come out with quotes like this one. If the universe had not been made with the most exacting precision, we could never have come into existence. It is my view that these circumstances indicate that the universe was created for man to live in. It's John O'Keefe, a, a NASA astrophysicist, and his comment on the universe. And I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that that's how we know that God created the planet, because it's like no other. You can argue as long as you like about evolution, but find it somewhere else. I mean, really, if the probability of evolution actually worked, the universe should be teeming with life. That probability shouldn't just occur on Earth. The probability should occur everywhere. 
All the planets around us should be teeming with life, and they don't. There's only this thin sliver of area of life in the entire universe. Well, if God created the planet, let's get down to the Bible. What did he create it for? He didn't create it for no reason at all. It is truly a crown, if you will. I'm going to use a, a little symbol tonight and talk about it as a crown. It's a beautifully designed piece. But you know what God wants with this crown? He wants to glorify it yet further. Let's go through three simple quotes, very dear to Christadelphians, very dear to Bible students, in which we can outline what God's purpose with the planet is. Just three quotes, if you will. Let's have a look at them now. The first one is Numbers 14 and verse 21. I will put them up on the slide, but I encourage you to turn them up. Because if you read it in your Bible, you know where to find it next time. <coughs> Numbers 14 and 21. God simply puts it like this. As truly as I live, I will fill uh, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. So the earth is designed for God's glory. It's going to give God glory, like a, a wonderful masterpiece, if you will, a crown, a, a fantastic piece of workmanship. And God intended that, the, the planet, to give him glory. Now, how's he going to do that? Is it simply by the wonders of creation that we see? God had a greater plan than just filling the earth with beautiful animals, beautiful flowers, beautiful scenery pieces. He had a greater plan than that. Because that idea of glory is explained for us elsewhere in the Bible. Very simply, let's come across to John chapter 1 and see a demonstration of the glory of God. And we can get no greater demonstration of it than the man Jesus Christ. And this is how the writer John describes the man Jesus Christ in John 1 and verse 14. He describes him as the purpose of God embodied in human flesh. And the word was made flesh. That word for word is, is purpose. The idea, the concept that God had. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. So based on that quote and, and based on what we know of Jesus. What could we say the glory of God is? Well, it's a character of grace and truth. That's the glory of God. And what's God going to do with this? We've talked about the beauties of the natural world being like a crown. These are like the jewels. People with this character of God are like the jewels. What does God plan to do with those people? He plans to set his jewels in fit settings in this masterpiece that he's created. His masterpiece is not just a world of beautiful animals and beautiful scenery. It's a world of wonderful people, people who have the character of Jesus Christ and who fill the earth, making it not just a beautiful place, but a loving and caring place. Let's have a look at uh, a final of the three quotes that I want to look at. Gen Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, describing God's plan with the planet. Did he intend just to leave it to man's misrule for mankind to make a mess of the wonderful world that he's created? He says this, Daniel 2 verse 44. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces <coughs> and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So there we have it. God plans to take this group of people who are his glory and to make them a kingdom, to make them kings ruling over the earth and they will make the earth into the wonderful place that God intended it to be. So if you will, you want to, well, I'm sure we could expand on this topic for quite some time, but we have other things to consider. These three quotes tie together for us in a very simple way the purpose of God with the planet. He wants to fill it with his glory, his glory is best seen in, in, in people with the character of Jesus Christ who live by grace and truth and God intends to make those people a kingdom which will rule over the whole world. Simply put, that's God's purpose with the planet. 
Well, you might look at me and say, well, that's wonderful, James, but it doesn't look like it out there now. You know, we recently heard in the last week of people describing the wars going on as World War III. I hear so much about starvation, cruelty and violence in the news. Your plan that God's describing here in the Bible just isn't working. Well, ladies and gentlemen, no, it's not. And the reason is because of mankind's greed. Let's have a look at some of the things that we can find out. I hope that's not too small. I'll read it for you. I just found this uh, fascinating thing from Huffington Post, which describes for us just why it's not working, just why mankind really isn't getting there, turning the place, the world, into a wonderful planet. It, it talks about uh, food provision. Now, when we really get down to it, food, water, energy are vital issues of today. If, we can't be, if they can't be solved, the world cannot be made into the wonderful place that it was intended to be. Hunger is caused by poverty and equality, not scarcity, says this article. For the past two decades, the rate of global food production has increased faster than the rate of global population growth. The world already produces more than one and a half times enough food to, food to feed everyone on the planet. That's enough to feed 10 billion people the population peak we expect by 2050. Population now is eight, around 8 billion people and the world produces 10 billion people's worth of food. So why are people starving? Why are there wars over food and resources if the world's producing enough to feed 10 billion people, not eight? Well, the answer is that the people making less than $2 a day, most of whom are resource poor farmers, cultivating unviably small plots of land can't afford to buy food. They can't afford to buy the grain to put in their land, to grow food even. In reality, the bulk of industrial produced grains goes towards biofuels and combined animal feedlots rather than food for the one billion hungry on the planet. See what we're doing? Instead of turning the food around and feeding the hungry of this planet, showing God's glory, being the sort of people that God would have us to be, mankind instead is turning it into fuel to run our cars, because that makes more money, and turning it into livestock feed, so that we can make more beef, to make things like hamburgers, not the food that everyone can afford to eat. The call to double food production by 2050 only applies if we continue to prioritise the growing population of livestock and cars over hungry people. It is why a four, the 400 expert commissioned for the four-year international assessment of agriculture science and knowledge for development also concluded that agroecology ag agro and locally based food economies were the best strategy for combating poverty and hunger. So the world can see they've got a problem. And they decided they'd put together a committee. You know the committee's not going to solve the problem. Have you known a committee of humans to really solve this problem of hunger? They don't do it. And the reason is selfishness. They're more pleased to be driving their car, thank you very much, rather than feeding the, million, the billion starving people on the earth. You know, I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the way we are going, we cannot solve the world's problems. We cannot make the world look like the sort of planet that God created it for. Let's go through a few other little pieces of information. 33% of the total global warming effect can be attributed to our food systems. So a third of the global warming effect or the, the, the um, environmental change effect that we're, we're, the world is apparently undergoing is caused by livestock. Livestock production alone can, contributes to 18% of global warming, more than the emissions of every single car, train, plane on the planet. <laughs> in other words, if you want to save the planet, just don't eat hamburgers. Can you see everybody rushing to do that? You see, what's happening is, we claim that we want to save the planet, but we're not really willing to do it. Just look at this little graph. This is the amount of energy used to produce different types of food. Corn doesn't take a lot of energy, nor does milk, apples or eggs. When you get down to beef, it takes an awful lot of energy. But nobody is prepared to stop eating beef. You see, so the world is choosing different types of food because they like them. And they don't care if other people are starving just because they like to have their hamburger. 
What about this one? Here's another thought. Energy consumption. Aren't we all going for green energy these days? I've put a solar panel on my roof. Aren't I a wonderful person? Not really. You know, our energy consumption worldwide is only trickling ever upwards. And how are we using energy? What sort of energy are we using? <coughs> you know, we talk about renewable energies and how wonderful renewable energies are and they're going to change the planet. Are they? Just have a look at this graph. See the red, grey and orange lines? That's oil, coal and gas. That's good for Western, Australian, Western Australia's economy, if people keep using that. You're all very happy for them to keep spending on those things because it keeps Western Australia going very well. You don't really want them to spend on renewables. Not good for your back pocket. But don't worry, it's not likely to happen. Look at the graphs. The graphs show that the world's consumption of oil, coal and gas is going up at a much faster rate than renewables. They'll never cross. We'll never reach a point where the world is relying on hydro, nuclear or other renewables. We won't get there. Not if those graphs continue to go the way they are. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we all think that we like to save the planet and make it into the wonderful place described in those quotes that we looked at. But I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the big points that I'd like to make to you tonight. Mankind can't do it. Mankind cannot do it. We've had all those years to work on it. We're not getting any closer. We're getting further away. More people are starving than any, ever before. There's more wars than ever before. And we're gradually going to ruin the planet the way we're going. This magnificent piece of habitable real estate in the universe is going to be destroyed by mankind if they're permitted to carry on their own way. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the good news we've got to present to you is God doesn't intend mankind to go on working this way. Mankind is going to be stopped in their tracks. And what we're going to talk about for the rest of the night is some steps that God is going to employ to change this world for the better. Because mankind can't fix their own problems. God is going to have to step in and intervene. And he could use people like you and I to do it. If we're willing to be involved in God's plan now, and in the future, we could be involved in turning the planet into the sort of place that it's meant to be. How's God going to fix it? Well, I'm going to present to you an eight-step plan. I feel like a little bit of a, a politician by doing that. But an eight-step plan of how the world is going to be changed. The first step is one that I couldn't pin down to one particular quote. And that is that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to earth. <coughs> The reason why I couldn't pin it down to any particular quote is because it's everywhere throughout the Bible. That very tightly packed uh, overhead there shows you that there's literally hundreds of quotes. There's approximately 130 quotes that just I could think of. Um, there's a very small selection of them there on the slide. On average, that makes one every 25 verses across the Bible. It's just phenomenal. When you start looking for Bible pas passages about the return of Christ to earth, there's hundreds of them. There's, they're all over the place throughout the Bible. You could hardly turn a page. I and mean, if we're only 25 verses between references to it, how are you going to turn a page without finding one? It's very hard to do. So the first idea that God has for repairing <coughs> the planet is to send Jesus Christ. Now, I talked to some of my patients about this. And I, I openly ask them time and time again, is there a politician you can name who can fix the planet? And they'll say, no, we've got no confidence in any of them. And I say, well, what about Jesus Christ? Now, they don't believe he's coming back. They say, well, if he did, he's about the only person who could fix it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's God's plan. What he says in the Bible is he doesn't just say it in one place. It says it over and over again across the Bible. What's Jesus going to do? Well, if mankind is not able to solve the world's problems and they're only taking our problems worse and worse and taking us deeper and deeper into the mire, then a clean sweep is required. If you're still in Daniel, come back a book to Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38, step two. There's going to be a clean sweep. There's going to be a fresh start, and in order to do that, God's going to have to remove the governments of this world. 
And this is how it's going to occur. It's, it's not going to be entirely pleasant, I, I have to tell you. Ezekiel 38, verse 18, And it came to pass, at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in, up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the fowl of the heaven, the beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. What's described there, ladies and gentlemen, is horrific. It is a worldwide earthquake, an enormous worldwide earthquake on the scale that the world has not seen yet. You know, the, the phrase in the Hebrew, the, the Old Testament is translated from Hebrew into English, but where it says in our English, the steep places shall fall, it, it, it's also translated by some experts as the staircases, the tall buildings. You know, those skyscrapers that are being built around the place, many of those will come down. And that, that will be indeed horrific, but it may well be, well it is, what is required to have a clean sweep, a fresh start with mankind. Do you know, it's not only the enormous constructions of mankind that will be brought to nothing, but we're told that God will bring down the attitude of mankind. Because nowadays mankind has such an enormous faith in himself that he's almost unable to listen to what God has to say. And it's only once that's brought down that mankind will be prepared to listen. So the pride of man, ladies and gentlemen, for their own good, must be brought down. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 2, and we'll go on to the third of our eight-point plan. We skip a few, through a few verses here. Verse 11, And the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Just skip down to verse 15. And upon every high tower, and upon every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all the pleasant pictures, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of man shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish, they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he shall arise to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made, each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. You know, I, I don't know that the Bible directly speaks of technology, but I'm wondering whether that's what it is speaking about in this particular reference here. By describing pleasant pictures, in today's terminology, the way you'd have pleasant pictures would be an iPad, a new iPhone, some sort of fancy computer. That's the pleasant pictures of mankind. And it talks also in these verses of things made of metal that mankind has made for himself to worship. Well, mankind trusts in technology more and more these days. And it looks to me like when that earthquake comes, the spirit of man, the attitude of man, the trust in himself will be broken down to the point where he simply throws those things into holes in the ground. You know, there's that famous Indian saying that it's only when every last thing is destroyed that man will realise that he can't eat money. And so when the earthquake comes, mankind will finally realise that he can't survive on technology. So those things that, that man takes great pride in will be debased in that day. It will bring about a change in attitude in mankind so that they'll be prepared to listen to what God has to say. They'll be prepared to be changed from their selfish ways. Come across to Isaiah 35. This is the next step in our eight-point plan. God just doesn't intend to bring destruction in order to bring man down a peg or two. But after that, he intends to make the place of his feet glorious, to 
put his jewels, those people who have his character, into fit settings to glorify the earth. And it tells us how he's going to do it in Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. Who's the them? It's those jewels, the people that are his, that, that are his glory by their character of grace and truth. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. And the glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, and the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. And they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. For the wilderness shall, break out, uh, shall waters break out, and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, in the habitation of dragons, where, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. Here in Australia, those are welcome words. They are words to tell us that what God will do in the future age is he's going to make an example of wilderness places, example of what he's doing with mankind is it going to reverse the fortunes of the dry land and bring rain to bring life in those difficult places. You know, for us, that will be a wonderful thing to see. We, we love seeing Australia brought out in flowers, but what about the poor, starving people in Africa on those unviable plots of land? This here is the difference between life and death for them. And God is going to provide them with security, food security, in those places where mankind's rule never gave food security. That's what they'll be given. They'll be given water even if they live in a desert place. Those unviable plots of land where people starve to death will suddenly be turned into lush gardens, providing all their needs. You know, we're told not only that there'll be agricultural security, but there'll be military security. Come across to Micah chapter 4 for our next point. Micah chapter 4 and sorry about this slide I accidentally have slipped in part of Psalm 72 it should belong to the next slide but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree and none shall make him afraid for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it now please ignore the rest about Psalm 72 for a moment you know what that says it says that people will rely on agriculture for life. There they are, sitting under their vine and fig tree. In other words, the man owns a vine and a fig tree. Those things don't produce fruit immediately. They're something that take time to produce food. And none will make him afraid. Now that's the problem nowadays, is you get the poor farmer, and he works hard to produce crops, and yet he's always afraid that someone will come and take it off him. The banks, the military, some rev revolution in his poor country will come and take it off him. But in that day, God's commandment will be this, that if a man can sit under his vine and fig tree, he is able to eat of those fruits of his labours. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Because so often now in this world, people are starving. It's not because they don't grow food. It's just because others don't permit them to eat the food that they grow. Well, that's all going to change in the future day because of God's command. God will command it that there is agricultural and military security for even the poor of the earth. Come over then to that Psalm 72, and we will read verse 16 there. Psalm 72. And we'll read verse 16 first, seeing it's there. There shall be a handful of corn on the top, uh, in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. I intended in my next slide to come to Psalm 72, and a couple of verses earlier. Verse 12. For he shall de deliver the needy when he crieth, and the poor also in him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and the needy, and he shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. You know, ladies and gentlemen, that's not what we see in our lives today. If you've got money, you might be able to buy some degree of legal justice. It's a legal system, though. It's, it's not really a justice system. If you can afford it, you can have someone protect you in a case of law. But what if you're poor and needy? 
What voice have you then got to stand up for your needs? Nothing. But in that day, what it says is a wonderful change will take place, that it won't matter how much money you've got, <coughs> that God will ensure the safety, the protection, and the feeding, even of those who nowadays have no voice, the poor and needy. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful time we can look forward to. Let's go on a little further in this plan. So God is going to renovate the earth and bring true equality and just judgment even to those that don't have the money nowadays. Okay, Revelation chapter 20. We're nearing the end of our eight-point plan. Revelation 20 and verse 6 shows us how that's going to be affected. How is it that there's going to be that justice security and military security for people on earth? Well, it's going to be a group of individuals who carry that out. Blessed and holy, sorry, this is Revelation 20 verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be kings and priests of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. There will be a group of individuals who are incapable of dying. And they will reign under Christ and with Christ for a thousand years, bringing about this time of justice and equity. You know, that's another problem we have in this world. You know, we can have a, a very good ruler on this world's standard. Let's say, for example, we had the, the king of Tonga. He was a nice chap. Um, you know, if there was troubles in his country, he did his best for the sake of his people. As far as rulers go, he seemed reasonably kindly. But he's dead now. And the next generation don't trust the ruling class in that, nation, that country. And so all the good things that he may have developed in his time are starting to be eroded. So the problem we may have nowadays, if we were to get a good ruler, of which there seem to be awfully few, and no perfect ones, is that they die. But what God promises is not only people who rule with equity and justice under Jesus Christ and by his laws, but they'll keep ruling. They won't just disappear off the scene, leaving the world to dissolve back into the rule of mankind. That's not going to happen. And how are they going to change the world? Is it going to be by the iron law of force? Well, it is. These rulers that will rule with Christ will rule by force at times, but their first method is different from that, something that the world today doesn't really use at all. It's education in godliness. Come across to Micah chapter 4. Here's the last point in our eight-point plan and perhaps one of the greatest keys to how mankind is going to be changed. Micah chapter 4 and verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain, the house of the Lord, shall be established in the tops of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow unto it. It's a funny word to use, flow, when you're talking about going up a mountain. It's unnatural. But people will choose to go to that place. Why will they go to that place? And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. What's going to be the effect of that? Verse 3. And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up, any, lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. You know, ladies and gentlemen, that's the greatest and most powerful changing force you can have to change people's hearts, change their minds, and teach them a better way of living. And that's the plan. That's the plan that those rulers of the future age, they may need to use force at times. But their first method is to bring a new form of education, an education in godliness. And when the people really see what that does for them, when the, the, the humans upon this earth really see what that does for them, they'll flock there to get it. Because it finishes wars. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there's our eight-point plan. I could spend quite some more time going through it. 
But basically what we've seen is Christ will return, that there will be a dramatic world earthquake, that mankind's uh, attitude will be changed about himself and his own power, that God will bring the earth around to being a place of prosperity agriculturally, and that mankind will be able to survive in agricultural and military security, that the poor and needy will have a voice of justice among the ruling class in that day, and that there will be a ruling class that won't pass away, but will educate the world in a way of peace. That, ladies and gentlemen, is God's plan. That's how he's going to bring that purpose that we stated right at the start into being. And you can see that throughout that, there's a place for individuals to work in that purpose. There's a place for individuals to make those changes, some of that community of kings and priests. You know, I, I found it quite fascinating. I looked up a, a list of key issues stated in a European survey as to the key issues facing mankind. And the Europeans seem to think that poverty, climate change, economic situation, international terrorism, energy, global population, disease, armed conflict and nuclear weapons are the key issues facing mankind. We've seen in eight points the answers to all of those problems. The poor and needy will be saved. There will be corn even on the tops of mountains and water in the wildernesses. There's a solution to poverty and hunger and lack of drinking water. Climate change, not a problem. The world will be renovated to be a wonderful place where there will even be streams in the desert. The world will be turned around. Instead of going downhill and becoming agriculturally less sustainable, it will become more sustainable. The economic situation will be changed because people won't be reliant on this tight system of greed and money anymore. People are capable of living comfortably off the land without fear. There's a solution to the economic crisis we may have. International terrorism and war, they're going to beat their swords into plowshares. Available of energy, you won't need the same sort of energy when the desert rejoices, when the desert comes to life and produces all your requirements for everything that you need. What about global population? Global population increase is not a problem if you can feed them, if you can keep them in peace and security, is it? Of course not. Can you imagine how many people we can happily sustain within Australia if we could make the centre blossom and flourish and be like a garden that we could feed people off? We could certainly feed many of those thousands of people that are starving in Africa and China in our wonderful country. What about the spread of infectious disease? The nations who don't represent themselves at Jerusalem, we find in another quote I haven't put in here, will suffer from disease or drought. But other than that, the longevity of mankind will be increased. Armed conflict, well, we've already talked about not lifting up sword against nation. And nuclear war, well, they won't be fighting wars any longer. Ladies and gentlemen, how can you be involved? Is there a way that you can have a part in that community who, in this age to come, go around fixing the planet? There is. It's very simply put to us. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ gave us some very simple requirements. When he left his disciples, he said to them, I want you to go out and preach to all the world. The good news, this is the good news. We've been talking about it tonight. The good news about the kingdom of God. I don't say that this is all there is to it. You'll find that an in-depth study of the Bible will help you greatly in understanding more of the good news. But come with me to Mark chapter 16 and we'll see his summary statement, if you like, of the requirements that he has of us. If we want to be involved, it's not complex, it's not difficult, it doesn't require you to have a PhD or an enormous amount of money. What does it require of you? Well, the Lord gave some very simple steps in Mark 16, in verse 15 and 16. He said unto them, his disciples, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. That means the glad tidings, the good news to every creature. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that's what we've done for you tonight. We've opened the Bible and we've showed you that, yes, it does tell us that God's going to bring some uncomfortable changes. But in the long distance, it's good news. God created this wonderful planet and he's got a purpose with it. And that purpose is good news. And he that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be condemned. You know, the process of baptism is not just a one-off occasion. 
of being completely submerged in water. The baptism that Christ spoke of, as we can find throughout Scripture, involves a turning point in our life where we have crossed over to a new way of life and we commit ourselves to following Christ's example. It's fairly obvious, isn't it? Because Christ wants people like himself, people who are God's glory, full of grace and truth, so that he can rule the world with them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we think as Christadelphians that the Bible message is plain, simple, and very positive, very encouraging. There is good news in a dark world. And the good news is this, that God created the earth for a purpose, and you all can be involved.